Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Gui Refuel, where I recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today is the 10th of December, 2020. All right, everyone, let's get right into it. So some big news out of Bitwise today. So for those who don't know, Bitwise is basically a uh, crypto index uh, company that basically does you know all sorts of different crypto indexes. They have a famous one called the Bitwise 10, which tracks the 10 largest cryptos by market cap or crypto assets by market cap, mind you. Uh, the the kind of news out of them today was that they have listed their index funds on uh, list. It's sorry, it's index uh, crypto index fund on OTC markets, and the shares are now tradable by via people's brokerage accounts. So this is basically just another example, I guess, of these crypto products or crypto based products making their way into the traditional finance system. Uh, for those who don't know, brokerage accounts basically, you know, exist within the traditional finance system, uh, as such as Fidelity is listed here, uh, and they are very popular in that system. Uh, I think some of them may be tax advantaged, uh, and that's why they're so popular. But yeah, I mean, you know, I, I personally haven't really played around with this stuff. Uh, I, I guess I, you could call me like a DeFi native. I grew grew up in DeFi with a lot of the, um, the, you know, in crypto in general with a lot of the stuff that I've done with my money. But there's still like a massive world, I guess, outside of DeFi. Like, I mean, DeFi is tiny compared to the trad traditional finance world. And uh, getting these products into the hands of these people and these kind of like avenues or, or, or you know, trading on a more traditional system is, is going to be very healthy for the growth of the overall kind of sector and market and all this sort of stuff. So as I mentioned, the Bitwise 10 crypto index fund is going to be on uh, on uh, available through these brokerage accounts. Traditionally, it was only able to be bought via private placements. Uh, now uh, the funds listing, uh, uh, the, now, as the block notes here, now the funds listing on OTCQX, uh, a market offered by OTC Markets Group, will make its shares publicly traded. So it's a pretty big step here for Bitwise. I mean, they've had this product for quite a while now, and I'm sure they've tried to been trying to work on this for quite a while. There's a lot of different, I guess, regulatory concerns when it comes to these things, uh, definitely around whether assets are considered securities or not. I don't think uh, any of the assets that they have in the index would be considered a security as lots of them are uh, basically, I guess, you know, Ether, Bitcoin, Litecoin, XRP, Chainlink, Tezos, things like that. Um, you know, I guess maybe Tezos would uh, would would be considered a security. Uh, you know, maybe sometime later down the line, it's probably a bit more of a gray area there. Uh, but definitely things like you know Litecoin, Ether, uh, Bitcoin. I mean, Chainlink and XRP maybe on the fence about, but not not as much as Tezos. Uh, definitely don't think they're going to be considered securities as well. And even if they are, I don't think that's a that's a big deal here since this will be trading on the traditional market. Um, and it's it, it you know it's a centralized product and and what have you. There's obviously going to be KYC there and everything. So uh, I think this is this is fine here. But great to see uh, just you know Bitwise getting involved here. Obviously, Grayscale is a big player in this area that has been offering a bunch of different products uh, for people to get exposure to through their retirement accounts. Obviously, the biggest ones being GBTC and ETHE, which you've probably seen them talked about how they always traded a premium to then you know then that the assets that they're tracking so i remember a few months ago if e actually went up to two thousand dollars a share uh which i mean sorry yeah, yeah two thousand dollars a share i think which put like eth at like i think it's like twenty thousand dollars or something like that something ridiculous um and it's typically traded like at a much higher valuation than uh than east you know kind of net price net asset price or net asset value uh same with like gbtc as well um, but I mean, those products are, are, are different to, to, I think what Bitwise is offering here and, um, uh, but they're still both in the traditional system. So good to see that playing out for, for Bitwise and, uh, you know, getting them on board with Fidelity, Charles Schwab, E-Trade, all these traditional platforms that we, that I guess kind of have a large user base, but don't have access to these products yet. Uh, we, we're just moving in that direction basically. All right, some news out of Grid Plus that I didn't cover the other day, but I really did want to cover. They finally got their Lattice One store open for business. So for those who don't know what the Grid Plus Lattice is, it's basically a, I mean, it's a, I mean, it does a lot of things, right? It's, I mean, once I load it up here, uh, it's basically a dedicated anti-tamper, uh, super secure uh, crypto, I guess, wallet, if you or hardware wallet, if you want to call it that. 
Uh, but it does it does a bit more than that, I think. Uh, it's I mean, it's been in the works for quite a while. This is from the Grid Plus team. Uh, they've been... Uh, I don't know how long they've been working on this for. Definitely for, for, for quite a long time. And they've really focused on security, you know, making this tamper resistant, um, being able to detect tampering, having different, having these things called safeguards, which allow you to, um, you know, safely access and, and store, sorry, store and then access your, your crypto. Um, it comes with like a, a, a touchscreen display, which is uh, fully protected by the Lattice One security system as well. There's a bunch of different features here. You got a secure mailbox, uh, secure computing environments, uh, it's an internal secure enclave. Uh, for, for those who kind of don't know what a secure enclave is, um, you know, from my understanding, it's basically a place where your kind of private keys are kept separate from the rest of the system. This is kind of how a ledger hardware wallet works, where your private keys are kept on a separate chip uh, to the rest of the the kind of um, the hardware, so that it's basically, I mean, it's not impossible to kind of you know extract the private key out, uh, but it makes it incredibly hard to do so. So yeah, uh, definitely, if you want, I mean, it, this is open for order right now. You can uh, pay with USDC, Dai, ETH, and BTC through Coinbase Commerce. Uh, credit cards coming very soon. You can use Grid tokens and redeem those to get $150 off a lattice, so uh, US dollars. So they're usually, for the base model, it's $299. So you can get basically a half price off that if you order it here. So definitely go check that out if you're in the market for something that's super secure to keep your crypto, like, you know, obviously um, incredibly safe and an alternative to the hardware wallets that we're used to, like, you know, the Ledger Nano S or uh, Ledger Nano X, or, you know, there's a bunch of others like Trezor, and I'm, I'm sure there's a, there's a bunch of others there as well. So definitely go check this one out from, from Good Plus. An announcement from Jeremy Allaire, the co-founder and CEO of Circle today. So Circle, uh, for those of you who don't know, is one of the companies behind USDC along with Coinbase. They basically manage and issue it and, and kind of uh, you know grow the USDC ecosystem. Uh, there today, he announced that they that Circle is going to uh, basically have this new platform that you know I guess expands the Circle ecosystem, the USDC e e ecosystem, to do much more than just payments. So they have a bunch of things here. They want to be able to do kind of payouts, digital dollar accounts. So I guess like bank accounts for your USDC, uh, marketplaces. I mean, there's a full press release here that you can go read. I'll link it in the show notes, but basically expanding what USDC can do. I mean, USDC has been on a tear this year. It's grown to over $3 billion. Um, the second largest stable coin uh, to I guess, USDT. Um, and now I want to take this a step further with all these different things. So what really caught my eye was this marketplace, I guess, thing that they want to do. And what they want to do is they want to obviously create a way for, um, you know, buyers to accept payments, uh, sorry, to, to use USDC for, for payments uh, and, and, and make payouts to sellers in, in doing this. Uh, and, you know, in both USDC and Fiat, have like a way for them to manage their accounts, kind of things like that, right? Uh, this is, I guess, all part of this, you know, banking the unbanked narrative that's been around for a while, getting these people who don't usually have access to the US dollar, you know, giving them really easy access. You can imagine countries like Argentina, for example, that have a lot of currency controls in place and don't have easy access to US dollars and have controls around that. You can imagine them being people being able to leapfrog that by using USDC, for example. Um, and this was in the news recently as well. Uh, there was another country, uh, I think it was Venezuela, where uh, Circle stepped up and basically said that, you know, they're going to be offering this USDC uh, to to, peop to the citizens to use, and they can use it for buying and selling and things like that. And I think this is what they want to expand out with this new announcement today. Uh, so it'd be really cool. You know, these people in maybe third world countries who are like, I want US dollars. I don't want, you know, my own local currency because it's hyperinflating or because it's not worth much or because there's currency controls or any of that sort of stuff, uh, I want to transact in US dollars. So, you know, imagine a merchant setting up an account saying we accept USDC here, uh, and then you can just pay with your Ethereum wallet, where obviously, you know, if you have a smartphone, anyone can set up an Ethereum wallet, and as long as you have access to the internet, you're you're good to go. Um, so that's what this is, this is here. And I think, you know, this is an underappreciated thing that doesn't really get spoken about much when we talk about 
you know, crypto and DeFi and, and you know, you know, uh, I guess like disrupting the existing financial, financial system and things like that. You know, we're, we're not only disrupting the financial system in that we're building better products than what they offer. We're also expanding the reach of these products. We're bringing them to more people than, you know, ever before. Uh, as I just mentioned, all you need is like an, a smartphone and, and an internet connection. You get an Ethereum wallet, you get some crypto, and then you can go and use all these DeFi protocols. Even if the front ends have barred your country from accessing them due to, you know, I guess regulations, you can still access the Ethereum network through other means, right? There's the, the, the front ends are just like basically windows into the smart contracts on chain. And those smart contracts don't bar people from different jurisdictions. They, they can't. Um, I mean, there might be a way to do it, but that would require centralized control. And uh, I mean, I think that would actually be really bad if a project did that. Um, that would introduce a host of different issues there. But basically, yeah, you can just access these comp incredibly complex products as well. Um, obviously, you can put, put up your money as collateral and borrow more money against it. Uh, you can do lots of different trading that you probably wouldn't be able to do in your own country. It's just creating this whole new system that basically just exists in cyberspace, right? Totally digitally native, doesn't rely on any of the old traditional systems besides a fiat on ramp, you know, in and out. But you can kind of leapfrog that by basically making it so that you can earn crypto as well, right? And then you can like buy and sell using crypto. So that basically closes the loop where you no longer need to use, you know, fiat on ramps to get in and out. Um, yes, USDC is a centralized stable coin, but I think what they're really trying to do is trying to go for that neutral kind of um, stablecoin where they're not barring anyone from using it. Um, but on top of that, it's not just USDC, right? It's it's other stablecoins like DAI, the centralized stablecoin, or you know any number of the other ones and all the other assets on Ethereum. So any decentralized asset is just you know available for these people to use. So yeah, really cool to see Circle doing this. I mean, they're, they're being so progressive with this. I really love it. And I kind of like get scared sometimes because I'm like, they're really... They're doing a lot here, and I, I'm surprised that the U.S. government or the regulations in the U.S. are allowing them to do this to this extent. Um, I was especially surprised about, I guess, the Venezuelan news, but I think that actually benefits the U.S. Um, and for those who aren't aware, I mean, from from what I know, that news was basically that they were allowing uh, people to use this currency that their local, that their government that was in power wasn't uh, allowing them to use. Uh, and was like there was currency controls and things like that around that. That's that's what I kind of understand from it. But I'm sure if you Google it, you'll be able to find exactly what that was. Um, so yeah, interesting to see how Circle keeps expanding here. I mean, you can see here that they want to do like yield accounts. They want to they want to obviously do a lot with Visa. I mean, I spoke about the other day that they've partnered with Visa to do different things here. There's just there's just so much coming down the pipeline for this stuff, and it's all built on Ethereum, like USDC. I mean, I don't know if it exists on other chains, but if it does, it would be negligible, the amount of USDC on that. So it's all on Ethereum. Uh, so it's really great to see to see this coming out and, and expanding beyond, I guess, the digital, uh, the DeFi natives and into the, the traditional system as well. Some really cool news from Tyler Winklevoss today. And I wrote about this in the Daily Gray newsletter today. So if you want to uh, get more context around it, definitely go check that out. But basically, he mentioned, I mean, this was yesterday, he said the Ether Fund by 3IQ Corp uh, will list on the Toronto Stock Exchange tomorrow uh, with the ticker Q QETH. Um, uh, tomorrow, I think that would be today. Uh, uh, this fund has already raised $75 million, apparently, and the ETH is going to be custodied with Gemini, which obviously Tyler is the co-founder and CEO of. Um, so yeah, I mean, I was just talking about how Bitwise is bringing their current crypto products to the traditional system. And now this 3IQ Corp is doing the same thing where they're saying, you know, we want uh, uh, ETH to be listed on the, I guess, like, or our ETH fund to be listed on the stock exchange, the Toronto Stock Exchange. You know, let's just do it, right? And they have. They're, they're listing it. $75 million is, is huge for, for something that is just starting out. I'm sure we're going to see a lot of inflows here. Uh, this could end up being, uh, you know, a competitor to... Uh, something like GBTC, uh, sorry, ETH E, not GBTC, but you know those those kind of line of products, uh, from my understanding, and I think we're going to see more and more of this listed on different stock exchanges. Uh, I hope that I mean I don't know too much about this particular one, but I hope that it's actually buying physical ETH and not just like some kind of derivative. I think it is buying physical ETH since it's going to be custodied with Gemini, so that's just more buy pressure on ETH, right? That's just more ETH being 
gobbled up by these funds. I wonder if they're going to do something with the ETH, right? Are they going to yield farm with it? Are they going to stake with it? I doubt it. I don't think the the um the uh, the regulations will allow them to do this. I think it's just going to sit in Gemini's custody. Um, maybe Gemini is able to do stuff with it. I don't know, but from what I assume, it's probably going to just sit in the in the cold wallet there. Uh, which is which is quite crazy when you think about it. I mean, I wrote about this in the Daily Gway yesterday about how you know there's going to be ETH basically gobbled up by all these different things, and you know there very well might come a day uh, sometime in the future where there's a quote unquote sell side liquidity crisis for ETH, where there's just lo lots of buy pressure, but there's not much ETH supply to go around because it's been gobbled up by things like staking, DeFi, like locked in DeFi, these kind of um, funds, you know, putting them into custody, people holding it as like a store of value, people using it, uh, you know, to do di all sorts of different things. So pretty crazy when you think about it, right? Uh, but it's still early days here. I'm curious to see how fast this fund grows because we'll be able to see the appetite from, I guess, traditional investors. If ETH E, uh, you know, uh, Grayscale's product is anything to go by, I think there's going to be some pretty big appetite for this coming in. So I'm going to keep my eye on this for sure. Right, a really cool little report out of uh, YEARN today. So I think this is the first kind of DeFi quarterly report. Uh, so obviously these are done for public companies uh, all the time. Like any public company I think is pretty much required to do a quarterly report. DeFi protocols obviously aren't required to do it, but YEARN has gone ahead and done it. So what they've listed here is they're basically listing, you know, their liabilities, their balance sheet, you know, the, the, the I guess like the net income and things like that. All the things I guess you would see in a normal quarterly report for a normal company, uh, they've gone ahead and just done this for the YN protocol itself. Uh, you know, operating expenses, you know, where they're going, sort of things, you know, who they were paid to, all sorts of things like that, which is, you know, quite quite insane, right? This is, uh, I guess, like the maturation of DeFi that we're seeing right now. And this is setting the bar for all the other DeFi protocols to produce this. Now, this wasn't produced by, you know, I guess like any central party, Wyon is a completely decentralized ecosystem. This was actually produced by the community and they um, basically got together and, and put this report together. And, you know, I mean, they, they list things like, you know, salaries being paid and stuff like that. Like it's fully transparent here, which is, which is quite crazy. I mean, if I zoom in here, so you can see the table uh, on the left side here, uh, you can see how much has been paid for like the month of October, September, August, uh, I'm assuming this is in uh, tens of thousands. So 21 here would be 21,000 US dollars, I think. Um, and then they also have a bunch of different things here. Uh, and then, you know, uh, team members that have left, team members that have joined recently, all that sort of stuff. So yeah, this gives you a way to check out their operating expenses and see kind of like what the profit is as well based on that. Um, they have like a breakdown of where all the grants went. I mean, it's just pretty crazy, right? When you when you look at this stuff, uh, this is like a fully decentralized ecosystem with a decentralized community of of, um, of people like contributing, getting paid for their work, and this shows up in this report here. So kudos to the Wyon team for putting this together. Uh, I think that, as I said, this sets the bar. We're going to see more DeFi protocols do this in the future. I mean, I would love to see this done for. Uh, for, for some of the top protocols like Maker and Uniswap and Compound, right? Um, because, I mean, when you really think about it, this is just like, I mean, it, I'm, I'm sure this is it, this took a bit of effort to do, but I mean, it's it, it's a pretty short report, right? And it's got like, a, it pays a lot of dividends if you show this and, and, it, and show this to people. And it, it basically helps people to evaluate the value of the YM protocol and of course the value of the Wi-Fi token. So yeah, I mean, the high, high return here for something that, you know, probably didn't take too long to do. Um, and, and, you know, it's just a nice little report that people can talk about and link to, to show the health of, of the network, basically. All right, so I've been talking about these, I guess, rumored regulations that might be coming in the US around, uh, I guess, like self-custody of crypto or self, you know, self-hosted wallets. Uh, it seems that Warren Davison, who is a US congressman uh, for Ohio, uh, is a bit worried about this and has uh, kind of uh, banded together with a few of his colleagues to put together this, uh, I guess, this letter to Congress, um, pleading with them to not introduce too harsh of regulations uh, and to not stifle innovation here. 
Now, I won't read the whole letter out. I'll link this in the show notes. You can definitely, or the YouTube description, you can definitely go read this for yourself. Uh, but yeah, the gist is, is that they're basically asking for them to not go too far here. So, I mean, it's good to have a congressman in our kind of like end of the court here uh, or our side of the court here because there's not many in, in, in the government that actually understand crypto, let alone have a favorable view of it, right? I guess the surface level view of crypto and of Bitcoin and of Ethereum is usually, uh, I guess, whatever the media kind of says. And the media loves to harp on about things like, you know, it's used for drugs, it's used for money laundering, it's used for terrorism financing, all this sort of stuff, right? When in reality, I mean, they, I mean, it's used for so much more than that. And that's just like saying, you know, reporting on cash and saying, you know, cash is used for buying drugs and, and all that, all this, all that sort of stuff, right? So, I mean, obviously garbage things out of the media as usual, but, uh, you know, that's the things, unfortunately, that people aren't clued into this ecosystem will see. So we need people like Warren in Congress to educate the other Congress people about these sorts of things. Uh, and not just them, but also, I guess, uh, the House uh, and uh, uh, I guess lobbyists in general. Like I'm not an expert on the US political arena, but there's obviously a, a lot of moving parts there. So we definitely need um, uh, more of this in, in the space. So, you know, kudos to Warren here for doing this. Uh, I hope that he gets some traction with this. I hope that uh, Steve Munichin, who is the Treasury Secretary and the one rumored to be announcing these regulations, I hope that he reads this and sees this and understands. Um, uh, as I said, as I've said the past couple of days, I'm holding out hope this, that this isn't, you know, these regulations aren't going to be too brutal. I mean, I speculated that I think that we might just see exchanges tightening KYC laws uh, and with and maybe having to limit withdrawal addresses for people so that they don't have unlimited withdrawal addresses. They can only have a few, um, which wouldn't be world ending. I don't think it'd be, I mean, I don't think it would do much damage at all, to be honest. I do think it's unfair though. So I hope that there's nothing like that. But if it is just that, then I mean, we can breathe a sigh of relief. But if they do go as far as banning self-hosted wallets or you know, or, or something like that, that's going to cause like a quite a stir. And that's going to be pretty much like scorched earth, I think, where you're not allowed to withdraw from a centralized crypto exchange to your own kind of crypto wallet um, uh, you know, at any time, which to me would just like basically force a lot of these centralized exchanges to go offshore because... I mean, obviously, a lot of people want to be able to withdraw to their own wallet uh, for numerous reasons, right? Whether it's to do stuff in DeFi, to self-custody, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, or I just, yeah, I just don't see that happening uh, unless, you know, the people putting in these regulations have absolutely no idea and no one has told them otherwise. Um, and, you know, that's always a risk as well. So we'll see what happens. Hopefully it doesn't happen. Uh, you know, hopefully that doesn't happen. But you know, it, there's always a risk there. So good good to be aware of that for sure. All right, the Ethereum Foundation put out an update today or yesterday, sorry, about their, uh, their supported teams, uh, basically. So what this is, is that the EF gives out grants to different teams within the ecosystem, within the Ethereum ecosystem. Uh, and they do a kind of, a, I think it's a quarterly update or maybe it's a monthly update. No, I think it's definitely a quarterly or a half yearly update actually on where that money's going you know, who they're funding, how it's being used, what they've delivered. So as you can see here on this list, they're funding a lot of different things, the Ethereum Foundation. And for those who don't know, the Ethereum Foundation has uh, a, quite a war chest. Um, I think last time I checked, they have $330 million worth of ETH left still. And they also have a, a sizable fiat balance, which isn't public, but they did sell $80 million worth of ETH at the near top in 2017. Um, uh, so they, yeah, they definitely have a lot of money here to, to, to kind of like splurge on a lot of these projects, which are, are very critical. I mean, you can see on this list here, they're, they're funding a lot of zero knowledge proof research, which obviously does a lot for layer two scaling. They're obviously, you know, funding the ETH2 effort, funding ETH1 as well, uh, funding a, a bunch of different things around solidity, making sure that people are, are upgrading that and making that easier to use, uh, all these sorts of things. So this is rather long update from them and you can obviously go read through it if you'd like. I'm, I won't read through the whole thing here, but it basically gives an update on each of the things that they're funding, what they delivered, some some kind of like milestones and things like that, uh, and like things going forward that they're working on as well. So 
I mean, you can see me scrolling through here. This is quite lengthy. So definitely go check it out yourself if you want to learn about all the teams that the Ethereum Foundation is supporting and all the exciting work that they're doing as well. I mean, you know, it's not just ETH2 and I guess, I guess ETH1.x as it's come to be known as. There's a lot of different things being funded and worked on outside of that as well. So definitely go check this out to get more context around that. All right, last thing to talk about was a really good tweet from Masari today that basically shows that Ethereum is on track to process more than $1 trillion in real value transfers this year. $1 trillion. This is more than Bitcoin for the, uh, I mean, like for the first year ever and in a big way. If you look at the previous years here, so for those who are listening to the podcast, you won't be able to see this, but in the previous years, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, Bitcoin was always ahead of ETH and by, by a pretty large margin as well. I mean, in every year, almost double the amount of volume that ETH, the, the Ethereum network was doing, sorry. So this year, the tables have kind of like completely changed where I guess Bitcoin's total value kind of moved on chain has actually stayed kind of stagnant from 2018, 2019 and 2020. In 2018, it was $849 billion dollars. In 2019, it was 772 billion. This year, it looks like it's going to be 800 billion. So it's kind of stayed stagnant there. Whereas ETH in la last year, Ethereum was 297 billion. This year, it's over a trillion, as I just said. That's a huge three times increase uh, of value transacted on the chain in, in a year. Now, for those who, I mean, maybe went around in 2019 or weren't paying attention, that was a, it was a pretty brutal year for, for Ethereum in general. It was, I guess, like a Ethereum-centric bear market where DeFi didn't really exist. Ethereum was kind of like, you know, viewed as, as this dead platform because ETH's price was very stagnant. There wasn't much activity happening uh, until maybe, I guess, like towards the end of the year uh, and things like that. And it was, it was pretty brutal, right? And on the backdrop, Bitcoin was increasing again. Uh, you know, it was outperforming ETH and things like that. And, and it felt like everyone had turned into a Bitcoin Maximus or something again. Whereas 2020 has been a completely different tune, like basically a total 180 where Ethereum is, is not dead. DeFi has exploded. Its price has gone up a lot, right? The Ethereum network is being used more than ever before. Record high gas fees. I mean, I could go on forever about all the metrics that have just exploded in 2020 for Ethereum. But I think this one here is just the simplest way to show that Ethereum is the dominant blockchain today. The only thing that it is losing in it right now is market cap to Bitcoin. And I really do think that's just a function of Bitcoin being first and the inertia that it has behind it. But Ethereum is just doing so much more. Uh, and this is not to say that Bitcoin's bad or anything like that. But when you really crunch the numbers here, Ethereum is just delivering so much more value to so many more people than, than Bitcoin is, I think. I mean, Bitcoin's good and all for people who want to buy BTC, you know, store their value in it. Or maybe they're using it to escape currency controls or using it as a... As a, as a currency itself, which I mean, less and less people are using it as that these days. But when you think about what Ethereum's enabling, you know, just within DeFi, you have all these other tokens that people can use. Stable coins have been a big, I mean, 2020 has been the year of the stable coin as well. Uh, and that's happened predomin predominantly on Ethereum. So, I mean, there's so much to be kind of like bullish about here. And I think this is going to continue into 2021. This value transacted, I mean, DeFi just keeps growing, which means the value transacted just keeps growing. Ethereum is the beneficiary of DeFi, but also, you know, a, lo a lot of stuff's moving to layer two now as well. So maybe next year we'll have to include both layer two and layer one Ethereum. And I can only, you know, imagine what layer two is going to look like when it's in full force because of the scalability gains, right? And the efficiency gains there, we're going to see a lot more volume being transacted across. So really looking forward to seeing that. Uh, great report out of Masari here. Uh, definitely go check out uh, their full report. I think this came from their ETH2 report, uh, which is linked here, which will obviously be in the in the show notes for you to check out as well. All right, that's it for today, everyone. Thank you for listening and watching. If you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel yet, be sure to do so. Give the video a thumbs up and I'll be back tomorrow for another episode. Thanks, everyone.